Well, this morning we are continuing our series in the book of 1 Corinthians together, the book of 1 Corinthians. If you would, please uh, turn in your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 12, and we're going to go through the rest of the chapter. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 12 through 34. If you're using the Bibles and the seatbacks in front of you, that's found on page 961, page 961. What we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, hold off. We normally read all the way through the text and then go into it. Um, This morning, because we're covering a large uh, section of scripture, we'll read the text bit by bit as we move along and through this passage. So open there, keep your Bibles open on your lap. And uh, let's begin this way. You know, last week, Pastor Chase preached a phenomenal message on 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. He reminded us that the resurrection of Jesus is something deeply historical. It's something, therefore, that is verifiable in real history. It's not something that you just believe with so-called blind faith. No, it's something that you can believe with reasonable faith based on concrete evidence. As Chase reminded us, like, just look at the transformed lives of those disciples who encountered the risen Christ. Or or just look at the fact that 500 people saw the risen Jesus at the same time. Like this couldn't have been a hallucination. This wouldn't have been, to be sure, a hoax. No, the only reasonable explanation is that Jesus Christ really did get up from that grave. Charles Colson was famously involved in the Watergate scandal. And uh, as you know, later he converted to Christianity. And he said this about the resurrection. Quote, he said, I know the resurrection is a fact and Watergate proved it to me. How? How? Because 12 men testified they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. (laughs) You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. Well, based on last week's sermon, let's assume for a moment today that Jesus really did rise from the dead. Let's assume that the resurrection is a reasonable claim to believe based on historical evidence. Let's assume that. In this morning's passage, the Apostle Paul takes the discussion one step further. Assuming Jesus really did rise from the dead, the question is, why does it matter? Why, assuming it's true, why does the resurrection matter? Why is it so important for Christians to believe in Jesus Resurrection. To put the question another way around, what would we be missing if Jesus died but never rose? You ever thought about that? I remember this one time as a young pastor when I had trouble explaining the significance of the resurrection. I was teaching this class uh, on the meaning of the cross. I was describing the very heart of the atonement, how Christ bore our sins and the judgment of God. He died in our place. He served our death penalty. I had this life-sized like cross this, this, and, and, and props that I was using to demonstrate how the cross worked. I was quite proud of that lecture. Thank you very much. But then as I was waxing eloquent, someone raised their hand and they said, you know, Pastor Eric, thank you so much for explaining to us the importance of Christ's death. But I was also wondering if you could explain explain to us, what's the significance of Christ's resurrection for our salvation? Why does the resurrection matter for all that God did? 
And I have to tell you, I was completely caught off guard, a little tongue-tied, I stumped. I, I fumbled my way, like a good pastor, I fumbled my way through some kind of answer. But because it stumped me, it made me go back and think more deeply about the resurrection. Why does it matter that Jesus rose? I wonder, brothers and sisters, what would you say if someone asked you, why does the resurrection matter? Could you answer them? See, here's the thing. The resurrection is not a secondary matter. The resurrection is not just some added bonus to what happened on the cross. No, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is actually central to everything. That's what I want you to see today. The resurrection matters for everything that we believe as Christians today. And Paul tells us in our text why the resurrection matters so much. In fact, Paul gives us three reasons why Christ's resurrection matters. Three reasons. Let's take a look. First of all, Christ's resurrection matters because it guarantees our salvation. Christ's resurrection guarantees our salvation. Pick it up there in verse 12. Paul says, now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. And then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Okay, in verse 12, did you notice? We, we, we learn about yet another issue that was cropping up among the Corinthian Christians. Apparently, some of them were denying the end times bodily resurrection of God's people. Let me remind you that one of the fundamental tenets of the Christian faith is not only that Jesus is risen, but also that one day Christ will return and all of God's people will be raised. All of God's people will be given resurrection bodies. See, saints, we are not meant to live forever as disembodied spirits. No, we are meant to live forever in resurrection bodies in a new heavens and a new earth. Well, some of the Corinthians were saying that there is no future bodily resurrection of the dead. You, you say, why were they saying that? Why did they think that? We can only speculate. Maybe some of them believed that the resurrection is actually merely a spiritual idea. Maybe they thought, well, we've already been spiritually raised and that's all there is. Or maybe some of them were pulling in Greek ideas about the afterlife into their Christian thinking. New Testament scholar Tom Schreiner explains it this way. He says, quote, those who were doubting the resurrection probably believed in accordance with the thoughts of many in the Greco-Roman world that the soul continues to live since it's immortal, but the body perishes. This was Greek thinking, right? Immortality of the soul, perishability of the body. Regardless of why these Corinthian Christians denied the resurrection, Paul wants them to see why such an idea is devastating for their Christian faith. It is devastating for their Christian faith. Notice Paul's logic with me carefully. Look there, verse 13. He says, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. You see the connection there? If there's no general end times resurrection, even Jesus hasn't been raised. Those two are connected. They are linked. Then verse 14, if Christ has not been raised, 
then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. See, Paul's preaching hinged upon the resurrection of Christ. If that didn't happen, then Paul is a charlatan and he's mis misrepresenting God and the faith of the Corinthians is absolutely futile. Verse 16, for if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been, has, has not been raised, your faith is futile. And notice this, you are still in your sins. You're still in your sins. I want you to notice a deep connection right there between the resurrection of Jesus and the forgiveness of our sins. You say, how does the resurrection of Jesus somehow connect with the forgiveness of our sins? Well, here's the connection. Remember what was happening on the cross. Christ was bearing our sins as a sacrifice unto God. Christ was paying off our moral debt. Christ was dying our death penalty. You follow? But then he rose. And the resurrection of Christ is God's guarantee. This is God's way of demonstrating that the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross was accepted. It was sufficient. The resurrection of Jesus was God's way of showing us that the debt is now fully paid because he's alive. The resurrection of Jesus is a way for God to, to show us, to demonstrate concretely that his wrath against our sin had been satisfied, that the death penalty had been fully paid because after all, now he is alive. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, therefore, is a way of, is God's way of demonstrating that all our sins are truly forgiven. Imagine you had a massive credit card debt, just a massive credit card debt, and somebody came and paid off the balance in full. You're like, yes and amen. <laughs> they pay off the credit card balance in full. It would be nonsense to send in another payment the next month. Hear me, the resurrection was God's way of showing us that our moral balance was paid off in full in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus already served our time. Jesus already died our death. Jesus is alive again, proving that there's no more that can be done. There's no more debt to be paid. We are fully and finally and completely forgiven. That's the connection. And if Christ, listen, if Christ wasn't raised, it means none of that happened. We're still in our sins. And verse 18, look there. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Paul says here, if Christ wasn't raised, then every single Christian that you know that has died, that you thought was in heaven right now with Christ, has actually perished eternally. If anyone should be pitied, Paul says, it's Christians because they banked their whole life on a fairy tale. Do you see all the connections here, the logic? Some Corinthians were denying the general resurrection the end times resurrection, right? And Paul connects that to something even more important. He connects it to the resurrection of Christ. If the general resurrection isn't true, then Christ isn't raised. And if Christ isn't raised, then the Christian message is nonsense. And the whole Christian faith is meaningless because we're still guilty in our sins and we're lost without hope beyond this life. This whole paragraph, this, this if-then logic can be represented, I'll show you it here on the screens, 
uh, with our next uh, slide there. Let me, let me show you the, the logic of Paul's uh, statement there. Here's all the if-thens kind of put together so we can kind of picture it, right? If there's no resurrection of the dead, Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain, God has been misrepresented, our faith is futile, we're still in our sins, the dead in Christ have perished, our hope in this life only, and we should be pitied. You see that? See how all of that sort of connects in the logic of it? And again, some of the Corinthians were just denying the top statement, but it had implications for the next statement about Christ. And going from Christ on down, you can see how much his resurrection matters for every single thing that we believe. Without the resurrection of Christ, we have no forgiveness, we have no gospel, we have no hope, we have no future, we have no life. That's the point. Now, Paul's making all of these logical connections in a negative way. He's saying, if this didn't happen, then this, then this, then this. But look what happens if we flip his statements around to make them, them positive. Once we do that, this very same paragraph, here, here's, here's the positive logic. Paul is saying, if there is an end times resurrection of the dead, then Christ really has been raised. And therefore, our preaching is true. And God did raise up his son, and our faith is sound. And brothers and sisters, our sins are, in fact, forgiven. And the dead in Christ will be raised, and we have hope for all eternity. And of all people on the planet, we are certainly blessed. Come on. Look. Here's what I want you to see. That's the kind of hope you actually have, brothers and sisters, this morning. Christ's resurrection guarantees the entirety of your salvation and your eternal future. It all hinges on that. So this means that on days when you feel tired, anybody ever get tired as a Christian? on days when you get frustrated, on days when you get discouraged. Anybody ever been discouraged? On days when you feel ashamed as a Christian, you need to remember this hope. You need to remember that Christ is risen for you. His resurrection guarantees that your every sin has been paid for in full. I mean, let's be honest. As Christians, so often we feel burdened by guilt and shame. We wonder if we're really forgiven. Puritan pastor Thomas Goodwin tells us what to do on those dark days when our hearts feel overwhelmed by our sin. He writes this, he says, if sins do come to condemn or accuse, a good conscience is ready to say, Christ is risen and I was then justified in him. There is my answer, which nothing in heaven or hell is able to reply unto. So Christian, when you feel the weight of guilt, preach to your own soul, Christ is risen and therefore I'm forgiven. When your life sometimes feels pointless or meaningless, you need to preach to your soul. Christ is risen, therefore my life has enormous purpose. When you get plagued by doubts, remind your soul, Christ is risen. And therefore I have sure and confident hope. See, the resurrection guarantees that as Christians, this life is, this life is as bad as it will ever get because our future is incredibly bright. We are destined for resurrected eternity. The resurrection matters, church family. It matters because Christ's resurrection guarantees our salvation. But the resurrection of Christ also matters, secondly, because Christ's resurrection previews the end of evil and death. It previews the end of evil and death. 
Pick it up in verse 20 as we read. Paul says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all of his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are in subjection, it is plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. In these verses, Paul uses a very important metaphor. Uh, in verse 20, you'll notice he calls Christ's resurrection the first fruits. Do you see that? Christ's resurrection is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Paul uses the same word, first fruits, uh, down in verse 23 as well. well. What does Paul mean when he uses the word first fruits? Well, the first fruits refers to an Old Testament Israelite ritual where some of the initial stalks of the harvest were bundled together into sheaves and, 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 and brought to the temple and presented to the priest at the temple who would then take those sheaves of the harvest and wave them before the Lord as a symbolic offering expressing thanks to God for the whole harvest that was yet to come. It's the first, the first part, the first fruits that represents the whole. Paul Gardner explains it this way, quote, he says, the first fruits offering looks forward with expectation to the Lord supplying a full harvest. Indeed, the, the dedicated first fruit comes to be regarded as the guarantee of the full harvest. So we could uh, put it this way, those sheaves of grain offered at the temple were like a preview of coming attractions a preview of coming attractions. They were a preview of the full harvest that was still on its way. So what does it mean to say that Jesus in his resurrection is the first fruits? Well, Jesus' resurrection previews the future resurrection of all of God's people who put their trust in him. You see the connection? He's first and we are the full harvest. Our resurrection will be like his resurrection and his resurrection gives us a taste or a preview of what that final resurrection will be like for us. Not only that, but Jesus' resurrection also previews the total defeat of all the enemies of God, including evil and death. In verses 21 through 22, Paul compares Jesus to Adam. Did you notice? Whereas the first Adam brought death to the human race, the true and final Adam, Jesus Christ, brings life to all who put their faith in him. And then there in verses 23, all the way to verse 28, Paul describes the order of how all this is gonna go down in the end. He says, first of all, Christ was raised to life, right? He's the first fruits. His resurrection preview, it gives us a preview of the end. Then Paul says, one day Christ will return to this earth and all of his people will be raised to bodily resurrection life. Then Paul says, at his coming, Christ will wage war against and vanquish every rule, every authority, every power that stands against him. Christ's enemies will be put under his feet, even death will be defeated. And Christ will deliver his kingdom to God the Father. And then Paul says, even the Son himself will be subject to the Father for all eternity in this glorious liberated, beautiful new world. It's like a picture of a wonderful utopia, a wonderful biblical vision 
of a utopia still to come where evil and death are no more and Christ reigns with his resurrected people in a perfect and glorious world and God the Father is glorified and enjoyed for all eternity. As that great hobbit Sam Gamgee once put it, everything sad is going to come untrue in that beautiful new world. Now, people have been longing for utopia down through the ages, right? And hopes are always dashed. What's to say that Christian utopia is going to come about when all other utopian projects have failed? Well, here's the difference. Christ's resurrection previews a renewed world. The reason we can be confident that we will be raised. This whole world will be transformed. The reason we can have so much confidence about that is because Jesus' resur resurrection, we've seen it. It's a preview of things to come, isn't it? It's a preview of coming attractions. So listen, when you read the gospel of stories and when you read the accounts about Jesus' resurrection body when he appeared to the, the disciples, as you see him walking through walls, apparently, right? He meets them in that upper room through a locked door. And yet at the same time, he's got a physical body that can be touched. He's even got his scars. He can eat fish with the disciples on the beach, and yet his body can ascend into heaven. They watch as it goes up. As you look at Jesus' resurrection body, what I want you to see here is that his body is like a preview of what our resurrection bodies will be like, those of us who know him. When you see Jesus in risen glory, walking out of that grave, defeating death, it's a preview of a coming day when death will be fully and finally put away forever. When you see the risen Christ ascending up into heaven, it's a preview of the fact that one day he will return and he will defeat every enemy Think of it, all wickedness, all evil, all suffering, all death, vanquished by Christ. Here's what I'm trying to say. The resurrection of Jesus tells us how this story is going to end. The resurrection lets the cat out of the bag. Jesus' resurrection gives us great hope. It's all going to turn out well. And Jesus wins. Sometimes it helps to know how the story ends. Some of you, when you read a book, you go to the last chapter and you read the end. Why do you do that? Anyway, some of you love to do that. And sometimes it is helpful to know how the story ends. When you know it's a happy ending, you can relax. You can enjoy the ups and downs and tensions of the story, right? A few months ago, my kids let it slip out that Simone Biles was going to win the gold medal in the women's individual all-around gymnastics competition in the Paris Olympics. And they tell me this before I had a chance to actually watch the match, you know? And so at first I'm kind of frustrated. Like, guys, why'd you tell me? I wanted to watch it for myself. But then I realized, I know how this ends. I, I know the happy ending. I know the gold medal is ours. I, I know she's going to win. And so I'm just gonna relax and watch this match, you know? Pop some popcorn, put my feet up, and enjoy all the nail-biting twists and turns and dramatic moments of that match because I already know the happy ending. As Christian believers, listen, we already know the happy ending of all things. We see it in the risen Christ, triumphant over evil and death. His resurrection previews a whole new world where the champion is Jesus and we are on his team. So listen, what are you facing right now that's discouraging you or overwhelming you or bringing anxiety to your life? What do you fear in your life right now? No matter how big or small, cancer, loss, disappointment, pain, persecution, even death. No matter what you're facing, brothers and sisters, see the risen Christ 
for you. Picture him with the eyes of your heart. We know how the story ends. If you belong to him, you got nothing to fear. On the other hand, if you don't know Christ this morning, you have everything to fear. Your sins are not forgiven. You face God's wrath and judgment. Evil, suffering, death, they are all formidable enemies, opponents, and you can't, you can't win against those. But here's the really good news. God has demonstrated his great love by sending Jesus Christ to this earth to become a man, to live a perfect sinless life, then to die on a cross as a substitute for sinners like you and me. He bore the wrath of God that our sins deserve. He rose back to life in victory as we've been talking about this morning. He ascended into heaven where he reigns even now and he calls on you, he calls on me, he calls on us to repent of our sins and to put our trust in him. If you will trust him, call on him for forgiveness, receive him as your king, here's what God will do. He will give you the hope of resurrection life in a new world forever. And his resurrection guarantees that he can make that kind of promise to you. See, Christ's resurrection matters, first of all, because it guarantees our salvation. And Christ's resurrection matters, secondly, because it previews the end of evil and death. Finally, I want you to see that Christ's resurrection also matters because it gives purpose to our suffering in this life. Christ's resurrection gives purpose to our suffering in this life. Look there in the remaining verses, verse 29 and following, Paul says, otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Why are we in danger every hour? I protest brothers by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I die every day. What do I gain if humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us just eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor as is right. Do not go on sinning for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. Paul gets very practical here in these last verses. He gets very direct and concrete in these last verses. Uh, He says there in verse 29 that the practice of so-called baptism on behalf of the dead makes no sense unless the dead are raised. Now scholars are baffled by what Paul means here in this verse, baptized on behalf of the dead. It's the only place in the Bible that speaks of such a thing. And we can only guess what Paul meant by the phrase. And we can only guess what the Corinthians were doing in whatever this was. I'll just tell you one theory. Perhaps, perhaps what happened was that when someone became a Christian by faith on their deathbed, perhaps they were not in a condition to be baptized in that moment, or perhaps they died right then without being baptized. And so perhaps, just perhaps, the Corinthians were having someone else be baptized sort of as their proxy, like as a representative. Maybe. Uh, We don't know. Uh, It's hard to say, there's many other theories. You can see the commentaries for those. One thing we do know though, is what Paul's main idea here is. We, We know his main idea in making this point. See, Paul is saying that baptism symbolizes our death and resurrection with Christ. Our death and resurrection with Christ. So we go under and out of the water, right? So he says, baptism makes no sense if there's no bodily resurrection. All the symbolism is sort of meaningless. Well, Paul moves on and then he he, he points out that life for the Christian, with all of its trials, with all of its persecutions, with all of its temptations, with all of its difficulties, life for the Christian is only worth it if there is in fact a resurrection to look forward to. 
So there in verses 30 through 31, Paul speaks to his own life. He's like, hey, look at my own life. He says, I'm in danger every hour. He says, I effectively die every day. He even says in verse 32 that he fought with beasts in Ephesus. Did you notice that? This is probably figurative language to say that in Ephesus, Paul fought against ferocious human authorities and ferocious demonic powers. His life was on the line. Paul suffered tremendously for the gospel. The question is, why was it worth it to Paul? Why was it worth it to suffer like that? Well, Paul says it was all worth it because he has the hope of resurrection life. The resurrection makes it all worth it. In other words, pain now as a Christian is worth all the gain that we will have for all eternity. What makes an athlete willing to go through all that grueling pain, all that grueling training and discipline? Well, it's worth it, of course, because of the finish line. It's worth it because of the glory, because of the victory, right? In a similar way, what would entice you, Christian believer, what would entice you to endure temptation and trials and ridicule and loss for the sake of Christ? Here's why that's all worth it. It's all worth it because of the finish line. It's all worth it because of the resurrection life to come for all eternity, for all eternity. Our tiny little lives with all of our suffering that we go through have enormous significance as Christians because of our hope of eternity. That's the idea. Let me make this vivid. Imagine with me a timeline. A timeline going from eternity past across this room like a little thin string going all the way out to eternity future. So so to your left is eternity past on the timeline. Picture it going out past that wall, over to the horizon, and out into the distance. That's the past. The timeline moves forward into our present day, and now that little timeline string goes forward all the way across the room, uh, to your right, all the way out that wall, all the way out to the horizon, and off as far as the eye can see. Can everybody picture the timeline? That represents eternity. Now your life and my life, if you can imagine taking a little marker pen and you just draw a little tiny dot on that timeline. That's your life. That's your 80 years if you're lucky. Think of it. This tiny little infinitesimal speck on the timeline of eternity. And here's what Paul is saying. If there is no resurrection of Jesus and there is no resurrection of the dead in the end and there is no, therefore, there is no eternity, then your little speck of a life is completely meaningless. You might as well just eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we die. You might as well just pursue as much selfish pleasure as you can possibly gobble up because tomorrow, guess what? It's lights out and just poof, your life is snuffed out. And that's it. And I guarantee you, your great-grandchildren aren't even going to know your name. If that's all there is, then, then listen, you could just join Richard Dawkins in saying, quote, life has no higher purpose than to perpetuate the survival of DNA. Life has no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. There's your little life, little dot and then lights out, you're gone. On the other hand, (laughs) if Christ really did rise from the dead, brothers and sisters, if Christ really did rise, it means that those of us who trust in him are destined for resurrection life for all eternity. And therefore, if we go back to the timeline and we look at our little dot of our little tiny life, it means that every moment of our lives have enormous significance, enormous significance. Why? Because everything about our feeble lives is translating into eternity. Every moment of suffering for Christ is worth it because we get to share in his resurrection glory forever. You want a meaningful life? You find it in Christ. (laughs) You find it in him. 
So does the resurrection matter? You bet it does. Our salvation, the end of evil and death, even life's purpose, all depend on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Without his resurrection, all is lost. I'll never forget uh, the moment when tears were streaming down my cheeks as I sat in my professor's office sharing with him about the recent faith doubts that I was going through. I was a sophomore in college, and for the first time in my life, I was really struggling with the truth of my Christian beliefs. I had grown up in a wonderful Christian home, a very supportive Christian family. I had been raised to believe and embrace the gospel, and yet the questions kept tumbling into my heart. What if I just believed all this because I'd been socially conditioned to believe it? What if it's all an illusion reinforced by my upbringing? What if the biblical story is just brilliant fabrication? These were the questions. They were haunting questions. And so I found myself in the office of my Old Testament literature professor, a man by the name of Dr. Gary Burge. Excuse me, Dr. Gary Long. Burge was another professor, Dr. Gary Long. He was a man very well read. Uh, he was a man with many degrees. He was a man who knew several ancient languages. He had um, participated in a number of archeological digs in the Middle East. He was a man who seemed to have a vibrant personal faith. And he was so gracious to spend almost two hours with me, you know, this punky college kid. <laughs> almost two hours he spent with me just talking through these doubts. And as I unloaded my spiritual and intellectual doubts, I will never forget how he answered me. Sitting there with countless books behind him on the shelf, he looked back at me and he said, you know, Eric, I've been there too. I've gone through my own seasons of doubt. Now that right there was comforting. Like if someone this brilliant could be honest about his doubts, it meant that I wasn't crazy for having doubts too, and I wasn't alone, right? But then it was the second thing that Dr. Long said that especially helped me, especially encouraged me. He said, Eric, in my times of doubt, I've had to boil all my questions about God and faith down to this one fundamental question. Did Jesus really rise from the dead or not? Because if he really did rise from the dead, then it's all true. And I can build my faith from there, from that point up. If on the other hand, they ever discover the bones of Jesus in some Middle Eastern grave, then I'm forced to throw the whole thing out. He said, Eric, focus all your questions on that one central question and you'll have something powerful and historical on which to base your faith. That was great advice. So for me as a young college student, I focused in on the resurrection of Jesus and built my faith from there. The resurrection matters. You see, Dr. Long was drawing from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14 where Paul says, as you remember, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. But to put it the other way around, if Christ has been raised, then it's all true. And your faith is sound. Brothers and sisters, do you want a strong faith? Do you want a sound faith? and focus your faith on the risen Christ because the resurrection truly matters for everything.